Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and to tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, since you've come to me looking for a review, I would have to assume that you've already watched Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 5, Fugitive of the Jadoon. But nevertheless, for safety's sake, just so that you know, I will issue myself a... Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fan die master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about a half an hour too early. This is not a boast or a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff without seeing the century that came before, and you find out there just isn't that much that's new in the world, and it oftentimes interferes with your ability to enjoy something. But, man, for once, that was not the case on the Chibnall Doctor Who. Oh my God. Finally, finally, I have a good review for a Chibnall Doctor Who episode. Now, the reason for this is pretty simple. They didn't go back in time to beat us over the head with some SJW lesson. They finally went back to wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey science fiction for once. Finally, it's not about giving us a message, but rather a good story. Now, frankly, this episode should have been episode three, with the entire rest of the season then going about figuring out what in the hell is going on here. But finally, I can start becoming invested in these characters because there's finally a little character development. There's not much for the companions, but the Doctor finally has some kind of arc and some kind of mystery about her. Now, so Gallifrey has been destroyed. The Doctor goes back there to mourn when she's not near her companions. She is damned near on a mission to find the Master, and it actually tells us something about her character in this episode, because absolutely nothing, we knew nothing before this. This is the first character development in a year and a half that this character has gotten. And then add in the fact that we've got, um, you know, the Doctor, who we know nothing about and she knows nothing about, yet is somehow previous incarnation, an incarnation that predates the Time War and the Master destroying Gallifrey. And combine this with another Time Lord, Commander Gat, also from the Doctor's past, apparently. Then add into this Captain Jack, a wonderful character that I really enjoy seeing again. And then add in everything that's going on with the Cybermen and Captain Jack giving us a warning. Now, maybe this is related to this larger arc with Gallifrey and the other Doctor, but who knows, maybe not. But it is nice to see it being set up because we could just about be sure that Captain Jack is going to be involved in some way. I personally can't wait for Captain Jack to meet Jodie Whittaker's Doctor. We're now far enough removed from a male doctor having a relationship, romantic or otherwise, with a female companion, so having a female doctor meet Captain Jack might be a lot of fun. Now, I don't expect any romance or sex out of this. This is, after all, a children's program in the United Kingdom, but it'll probably still be fun when it happens. We've now got two mysteries on our hand, maybe only one or maybe three, depends how they tie in together. Something very timey-wimey is going on in the Doctor's past, and it's going to be fun to see that unravel. Finally, there is something to look forward to in a Chibnall-era Doctor Who. I have been utterly bored and occasionally irritated with Chibnall-era Doctor stories. The best of my reviews have been, it's okay. Now, I'm actually looking forward to seeing how this is going to work out. Now, mind you, as a fan die master, I think I can probably see it coming. But that's because I know about something that you may not know about. This may be an implementation of what Whovians call the Cartmel Master Plan. Now, I won't talk about this for fear of spoiling it from at Padawans. If you want to learn about it, there is a, a link to an article uh, um, on it on a Wikipedia page. 
in my description box. You can go and look for yourself if you want to see what they had planned. But suffice to say that had the master plan, it would have been an attempt to put some kind of mystery into the Doctor and the Time Lords after many years at that point of overexposure and overfamiliarity. And that's where we are now with, with the Doctor and the Time Lords. Now this would have been intended for Sylvester McCoy's seventh Doctor and would have been implemented if the series had, been, had not been canceled in 1989. It was hinted at, in fact, in a couple of the McCoy's episodes, but it never really came to fruition the way that the plan was supposed to work out. If this is an attempt to implement a version of the Cartmel Master Plan or something like it, then it's at least slightly different in as much as the Doctor doesn't know about the past here where the Seventh Doctor would have. The Doctor not want, knowing about it is probably a better way to do it. And we can, of course, rationalize not her not knowing about it pretty much the same way that they did in the Day of the Doctor. Only the latest Doctor can remember these events because their time streams have become entangled or too out of phase, and so their prior self cannot retain the memory. I would not be at all surprised if this new Doctor ultimately regenerates into a very young version of Hartnell's first Doctor. In any case, we finally have a good, engaging Doctor Who episode where we previously were bored and or irritated. I can only hope that the rest of the season will involve the Doctor figuring out what the hell is going on and then culminating with something really memorable for a two-part season finale. Learn from the past, Chibnall. Learn from the past. In terms of things uh, specific, I can get into review. I often talk about great moments. Pretty much just did that. <laughs> But I'll point out a few honorable mentions. As I said, Captain Jack. Um, I love this character. I loved him, except when he was on Torchwood. And that really only because those scripts tended to be too graphically horrible for my taste. Just wasn't something I was into seeing that level of horror on Doctor Who or in the Hooniverse. Um, but when he's on Doctor Who, he's always been great, and I can't wait to see him again. It's been... The Jadoon. I always sort of like these guys. Um, they seem real straightforward and have no compassion whatsoever. So seeing them here in uh, their complete total lack of compassion uh, glory is rather good. Uh, we also got to learn a little more about how to be really insulting to them. The prior doctor I liked very much. She spends, of course, most of the episode with her memories gone and then bringing them back via the chameleon arch, which had the doctor had used before in Tenet's era. That was a nice way, nice touch. I like the prior doctor's boyfriend. Uh, there's something interesting going on here. He must have been the doctor's companion, that doctor's companion, because he knew all about her and knew how to trigger her. But they clearly have a normal human relationship, so that certainly implies romance and sex. Now, we've never seen um, what a female doctor, uh, and in terms of doing that, and we probably won't with Jodie Whittaker. Um, but it works here, and his death being is a reminder then that the Doctor's companions do sometimes die. It's also interesting that he must have been in a military, apparently the same one that, uh, that the other Time Lord, uh, Commander uh, Gat, was in, um, which raises some interesting questions. Uh, he reads as human. He is aware of the Doctor and who she is, so he couldn't have used the Chameleon Arch. So... Who the hell was he and what's going on? I, I hope that this is something that gets resolved over the course of this arc. And just a minor thing, but I enjoyed the other doctors mentioning Jodie Whittaker's costume. That costume has always reminded me somewhat of the sixth doctor's costume, which was a horrifying clash of ridiculously clashing colors. Now, Whittaker is nowhere near as bad, but it's not as cool as the Doctors have been, have been since 2005. I would not mind seeing her, frankly, in something a little bit more feminine, and rather than a costume that intentionally desexualizes her. I often go about my cringe moments. Well, for the first time in a Chibnall Doctor Who era, I really don't have any. I never once found myself cringing at this episode. My mind was always busy trying to figure out what the next plot turn was going to be, and I was just generally enjoying the show for the first time in a season and a half. So no cringe moments for once. No utterly predictable plots, no irritating SJW moments, just a good story with some character development for that doctor and an arc being started up. I mean, an actual arc. <laughs> 
They have been missing these in the Chibnall era, and that's been rather problematic. Since 2005, there have been season-long arcs that generally fed into a doctor-long arc that would then resolve itself when that doctor regenerated. And that has worked well, um, both for giving us some long-term character development and by keeping us guessing. With 9, and, uh, with nine through 11, um, I was generally kept guessing. As a fan die master, that is hard to do. The fact that they were able to do so meant that they were doing things right for once. You should always, always, anybody who's making science fiction ever, whether it's professionally a fan film, whatever, always aim your science fiction at us, the Fandai Masters. Because if you can keep us guessing and entertained, then you can be absolutely certain that the Padawans will be kept guessing and entertained as well. So, cringe moments? I just didn't have any. For once. <laughs> now, I usually start out by talking about the writing, because the without a script, you've got nothing to shoot. Ultimately, the fault, good or bad, for any script and any story that you see in front of you on TV or in the movies is going to lie with the writer. And the writers in this case are Vinay Patel and Chris Chibnall in that order. Now, in the past, Chibnall's scripts have been terrible. Um, they're dumb, preachy, in a very irritating way. And it's the only way to describe them. Now, we've seen Vinay Patel script before in The Demons of Punjab last season. It was a history lesson that was rather irritating, though it was one of the only scripts where it had any kind of character development for anyone, and that was for Yaz, but it wasn't a hell of a lot of character development. I have to assume that most of this script was Patel's. And here we see what we, he can do when he's let off the chain and allowed to just write a good story. Now, no doubt Chibnall has control over the overall arc, but I think he turned over the writing duties to someone who's won two awards for his writing. And hopefully Chibnall will continue to do this for the remainder of the arc. Chibnall has clearly established himself as being boring, irritating, knowing little about time travel and science fiction in general. Now, having an arc in mind while letting the other writers off the chain is the right way to go. Chibnall is just a hack but Patel can do good work when he's let off the chain. In terms of the acting, there is not a lot here for the companions. They are reacting. Um, in terms of good acting, they're doing fine. They're giving a, a good performances, but there was no real character development. This was not about them as characters. It was about them reacting to the things going on around them. And uh, the character development was all the doctors, really. So talking about Jodie Whittaker as the doctor, well, finally, <laughs> Finally, Jodie Whittaker has been given something that allows us to see her acting talent. She has previously been completely underutilized as something that's just reacting to the things going around, on around her just to keep the plot moving. Her performances were okay, but they're, you, know, you have no idea of who the character is, and then you have no character development. There's nothing for an actor to sink their teeth into. But here, Jodie Whittaker has things to play as a character. Her mourning for Gallifrey, her anger and just plain out, flat out rage at the master, and her wanting to find him really bad because he's now a genocidal SOB rather than just killing a lot of people. He's genocidal. That was great. Her complete mystification about this prior doctor and where she fits into her life. That was awesome. And go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Call me a sexist, toxically masculine SOB. But after 10 years of watching the fangirls squeeing at the other doctors, I'm really enjoying that it's finally my turn. Oh, I'm certainly older than Jodie Whittaker, to be sure. But she's still old enough that I can still take my turn squeeing. When she finally is given something good to do with her character, I find her sexy as hell. She is certainly a very attractive woman, don't get me wrong, but I didn't find her really sexy until she finally had something to do. So, yay. So, for the love of goo, Chibnall, keep this up. Do not give us any more of those usual tripe. Keep this arc. Keep allowing Jodie Whittaker to act rather than just react. Now we have Joe Martin as uh, Dr. Ruth, I'm sorry, not Dr., but Ruth Clayton and the other doctor. 
She has been around a while. She's been active from 1988 to present with tons of credits under her belt. I thought she was quite good, particularly as the other doctor. Her transition from thinking she was human to being the other doctor was great. It was very similar to what Tennant's uh, doctor did when he used the chameleon arch. And it's very interesting that she is quite a lot more violent, it seems, than any of the doctors we've seen. And I think I know why, and I think I know where this is going to place it, but that's because I know about the Gargoyle Master Plan. But I think that's where I, I know where this is going, and I think I know why that is. But I won't spoil it for you. If you want to spoil it yourself, go to the link in my description box for the Gargoyle Master Plan. We have Neil Stuke as Lee Clayton. Um, his, he's also been active from 1993 to present and has a ton of credits under his belt. We don't really know who he is, other than he must have been a companion of the Doctor's. And I'm really, really curious to find out about him. He's, he can't be a Time Lord, he reads out as human, yet he's had the same military training as the commander of uh, the past, in the past of the Time Lords. And he can't be a, a Gallifreyan who's t done the Chameleon Arch, otherwise he wouldn't know about the other doctor having the Chameleon Arch. Very weird, probably very timey-wimey, very interested to see where this goes. And, they're at, and they're, it keeps me guessing. We have Rita Arya as Commander Gat, the other, the other Time Lord. Uh, she has uh, been active from 2013 to present, has already won an award. She's not here a lot, but she certainly comes off as the complete a-holes that the early Time Lords have always been reputed to be throughout all of Doctor Who. Whenever we hear about the Time Lords, they're great now. They stay out of people's way. They don't do much. They're supposed to be just watching. That was till the Time War. But they just watched. They didn't interfere. But there were always hints and always talking about how they were pretty damn savage in the past, right around the point which that they were starting to get into time travel technology. Again, watch the chib read about the Chibnall Master Plan. You may see where this is going. I'm not sure. In any case, we obviously won't be seeing her again, uh, but uh, being horrified by the Doctor violating the Time Lord's first law of time is great. A Time Lord is not supposed to cross their own time streams due to the obvious paradoxes, and they can be dangerous paradoxes that can occur. So when the Doctor has done it, it's generally been when the Time Lords were gone, and so therefore couldn't have uh, done anything in order to uh, punish her. In, in the episodes, the three Doctors and then the five Doctors, the crossing of time streams was actually caused by the Time Lords. And the others have happened either when they weren't around or just completely by accident. There's been a couple of occasions where that's happened. The director is uh, Nida Manzur, and she also directed the last episode, Nikola Tesla's Reign of T uh, Night of Terror. You can see my review for that. I have a link to it in my description box. The direction is fine. Um, it is appropriate. It isn't going to win any awards, I don't think, but it's well done. The cinematography gets into a weird area. The credits list no cinematographer on the episode. However, IMDb says that it was Catherine Goldschmidt and uh, Sam Heisman. I have no idea who is actually the cinematographer here and who should get the credit for it. It is similar to the direction. It is, uh, the cinematography is competent and appropriate. You know, one always hopes that there is some level of collaboration going on between the director and the cinematographer. You want the director to say, I want to get these shots, and then it's the job of the cinematographer to get those shots. But when they're working together, the cinematographer can say, hey, I can get you that shot, but I can get it in a little more interesting way. Maybe we can do this slightly differently, and hopefully you have something like that going on. I have no idea. Uh, I don't even know who the cinematographer is for sure, um, but the cinematography here is fine. The art direction was by Nick Murray. He's done six episodes for Doctor Who for this season and two in the last. Now, I very much like the interior of the other Doctor's TARDIS. Frankly, I way prefer it to Jodie Whittaker's TARDIS. It is far more like the classic interior with some alterations. Frankly, I wish this is what Whittaker was traveling around in. I have disliked that coral motif ever since it first appeared. But everything else is appropriate. The sets make perfect sense for every scene. It was perfectly competent. Nothing that's going to win anybody any awards. I do wonder whether the cathedral interior was location shooting or if it was a set. If it was location shooting, great. I love location shooting. 
If it was just a set, well, then uh, the green screen wasn't really obvious. We couldn't tell. The credits uh, only show music orchestrated, conducted, recorded, and mixed by. They don't show a composer credit. This almost certainly means that they were reusing cues that uh, 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 Sagun Akinola had already done for other episodes. And that's not unusual. That's not unusual at all. You can't afford to do new music for every single episode. So you choose the ones that you think are going to need the music most dramatically. And then you reuse cues. So when they did that here, it was perfectly competent. They managed to uh, edit it in such a way that it underscored the action, created some tension and other emotions when silence would have been boring. And that's what a good soundtrack is supposed to do. I do, however, still miss the specific musical themes for each character, the way that they were mixed and how that underscored the action. That was something that Murray Gold did amazingly for 10 years. I miss the fact that we don't seem to have those sorts of themes. The fact, frankly, that I didn't know that they were using pre-recorded themes is probably indicative of how there are no specific themes for the, any given character. I, I didn't notice. Um, that makes it more generic. But it was still mixed and edited good. Special effects supervisor is Sheila Wickens. There are always a ton of effects, and there is no way to know for sure when they are being used. Sometimes it's just out a window. And who to credit anything for anything, anyone for anything specific. You have to be inside the production team to do that. So all I can say is, well, what special effects were are were seamless and good. They were nothing that looked bad. You want something to look bad? Come back for my reviews of Batwoman uh, later today. Costume designer is Ray Holman. Now, he's done a lot of Doctor Who. He has done uh, some of 11's episodes, some of 12's, and all of 13's so far. The costumes here are competent, as they always are. Uh, a costume is something that should tell you something about a character. Now, if you met me off screen, my choices are a t-shirt and jeans, as a general rule. Frankly, if I'm going to be around the house, it's a t-shirt and jean shorts. It's what I've actually got on right now. My on-screen choice, however, of it, that, but that choice of what I would wear off screen would tell you something about me as a human being. Now, my on-screen choice of the white shirt, a western vest, the Indiana Jones hat, this is portraying something that feeds into my brand. I've always said that whenever you see something like on YouTube or movies or TV, it is what my old acting guru, the late, great Dr. William Morgan, used to say. Theater is planned, rehearsed spontaneity. So anytime you see anything on a screen or in a video, it must have been planned to some extent. Even lack of planning can tell you things. So when I wear this stuff, I will tell you that I am trying to portray an image. There is something that I am doing to portray it. A lot of people will just say, no, no, we're not doing anything different. It's just us normally. Ah, that's full of crap. You see anybody with good lighting? You see any, any reviewer, female reviewer, who's got the camera position so high that you can see down her cleavage because she's wearing something that would show cleavage that way? That there is planned. So with me, I just make no bones about it. I'm telling you, I'm doing this on purpose. There's a reason behind it. So all good costumes are choices made to show something about the character. And everything here does that. The other doctors changing her clothes from a human to a doctor's costume was very, very nice. Uh, as the doctor, she wore something that we can certainly imagine a doctor wearing. You know, it was, it was a doctor's costume, you know. The makeup supervisor is Emma Coleman, uh, Cohen. sorry. She has been makeup supervisor for 12 episodes of Doctor Who, 6 of 13s and 3 of 12s. She's been a makeup artist on two episodes, uh, one for 12s and one for 11s. In fact, her first credit for Doctor Who is The Time of the Doctor, the Matt Smith's last episode. Uh, she's been around since 2002 with a lot of TV makeup under her belt, did a lot of Sherlock, among other things. The Jadoon here, I think that falls under costuming to some extent and makeup. The Jadoon were great, as always. Uh, this is a slight refinement to what we've seen before in as much as one Captain Jadoon has uh, hair. But otherwise, it's the same space rhinos that we've previously seen, and that's great. I like them. Uh, human makeup is competent. It was appropriate. I mean, really, with human makeup, you only ever notice if something is very, very wrong. And one thing you'd always have to do when working, worrying about makeup is it has to look good under at least 
1080p. I don't know what they shoot this in, but it's broadcast in 1080p. If they're smart, they, uh, they shoot it in 4K. And getting makeup right for someone in 1080p is tough. I don't wear any makeup, and that's because I have worked very hard to position my lighting so that I don't have to. But in 1080p, if somebody's wearing a lot of makeup, it usually shows really badly. And here it doesn't show. So finally, at the end of any episode, we would ask ourselves, is it any good? Oh, hell yes. Finally, finally, a good episode. And I really have nothing bad to say about it. Uh, for the first time in the Chibnall era, I can actually recommend an episode. It is obviously setting up at least one, perhaps two, or maybe three arcs, depending on how things go. And we're going to find out something about the Doctor that I think is going to go all the way back to the beginning of Time Lord history. So yes, watch this episode. Absolutely watch this episode. I, I give it my absolute uh, uh, recommendation. Watch the show. And so that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That's all the time that we have today for this episode of The Highly Acclaimed, World Renowned, Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.